The information found in this video and related presentation is provided by the Retirement Research Foundation and is for educational and informational purposes only. Nothing in this video should be considered to be tax or investment advice. This is Danny Ronberg back with the Retirement Research Foundation and our exclusive interview with Professor Lawrence Kutlikoff. Larry, thanks for joining us again today. We appreciate having you back on. Um, okay, I want to pick up where we left off yesterday, Larry. We were talking in depth about potentially the sovereign debt crisis that the U.S. is facing right now. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what that is for people who aren't familiar with the sovereign debt crisis. You referenced Venezuela yesterday. Can you tell us what a sovereign debt crisis is and why it's so significant and people should be paying attention to it? Well, if a country uh, keeps borrowing money, you know, you know uh, uh, it, it accumulates IOUs, it has to pay it back. And uh, uh, rather, if it uh, pay, buy, borrows money and buys things, whether it's aircraft carriers or builds roads with the money, and it doesn't actually tax current people, then it has to tax future people, kids and future generations. So it becomes a burden on our kids and grandkids. So if that burden gets to be too big, then they can't repay and then you have to default on the debt. And that's what you, then, then you see countries uh, getting into big trouble like Venezuela, where rather than trying to raise taxes because they can't do that, they have to just try and print money which is uh, effectively like taxing people because it, it produces inflation and then the value of uh, their current money holdings goes down. But in our country, uh, we don't have very high inflation right now. We could have it in the future. We do have a lot of debt we, and it's growing. You know, we're running about a trillion dollar deficit this year, but then we have all kinds of off the books debt. So we take, for example, from young people, we take their payroll taxes, give it to old people in the form of, Medicare and Social Security benefits, we tell the young people, uh, don't worry, you'll get yours when you're old. That's an IOU, but it doesn't show up on the books. So when, they're, when the young people today are old, we have to hit their kids. And their kids may not be able to afford what we have to hit them up for. So we have enormous unfunded liabilities, off the books debt, off the books uh, IOUs that um, far exceed by a factor of about 10, the official debt. So our country is bankrupt, uh, you know, uh, just it's clearly bankrupt and that's why there are so many things that the country can't afford doing right now, like educating our children, like increasing social security benefits because we have a lot of very poor old people, like, you know, paying for basic research uh, and development, uh, so all these things are indicators that uh, infrastructure can't do that either, can't afford it. They're all indicators that we have a problem, that we're, that we're broke. Right. And so, you know, Larry, let me ask you a question, because you mentioned earlier that Wall Street may be encouraging people to take Social Security early to their detriment so they can reinvest that and collect fees. You know, there's, there's um, potential issues with Wall Street, there's potential issues with future taxation, there's potential issues with inflation. If you're retiring today, what's the most important thing to pay attention to? What are you cautioning people who are retiring today to be paying attention to for the future health of their retirement and financial security? Well, it's a difficult environment because there's very low interest rates. So, um, and investing in the stock market is a wild ride. So I, I'm encouraging people to work as long as possible and to do some real planning about the future. I think uh, uh, being careful about how much they're spending on their housing. They can downsize their home. They can move to a state there's lower taxes. So housing, using your housing costs can be a, a big saver, um, but also being very careful about when you take Social Security. And as you know, I've developed uh, software, uh, both for life cycle financial planning, for the rest of your life planning, but also if you're just interested in Social Security. Uh, but getting Social Security right for most households is a huge deal. And most people are taking uh, benefits far too early and giving up a much uh, better retirement as a result. Right. And Larry, we talked about your resume and why you're obviously, in, my, in, in, in our view, you know, if not the most, one of the most qualified professionals to help people with Social Security. And in our, in our view, there's no doubt you are the foremost authority on the subject, but you know, what makes your software planning unique 
and um, valuable because there's other softwares out there. What, what makes, you know, your software um, significant in terms of people planning for their social security choice? Well, on social security, uh, we're doing, uh, we deal with all, every aspect of the system. There are 11 different benefits that people have to pay attention to. You know, for example, a disabled child can collect on their parent's record once they, the parent starts collecting retirement benefits, or if the parent dies, they can collect uh, survivor benefits as children, disabled children. Yeah. So, uh, so we have a, an enormous attention, pay enormous attention to detail. So I'm quite positive, you know, confident that we are getting all the details uh, absolutely correct. But then the other thing is evaluating future benefits appropriately. That requires doing it the way economics says to do it. And I'm pretty sure that other programs aren't doing it the right way. I think they're focusing on people's life expectancy or doing some actuarial valuation, which is not appropriate given that people aren't going to be dying many, many times over. So you can't assume that you're going to die on time or at your, you know, expected uh, date of death. Right. Uh, that might be, you know, 20, 20 years and 30 days. Nobody's going to die exactly that day, right? Right. So you have to value your benefits before your life expectancy and after your life expectancy that you might get, and you have to value it properly. Otherwise, you'll make the wrong choice about whether to take the money for early or, or late. Right. That makes you, sense. What you take it late, you get a much bigger number. There's a lot of people that we run into at live events, Larry, who come in with the idea that they know exactly when to take their benefit to maximize it without running it through the software. What would you give as maybe some questions to ask that person to determine if they really are on the right track or if they need the software? Well, I, you know, I'd ask them a few rules and uh, questions about the rules. You know, do they know how much? Uh, higher the benefit will be if they wait till 70 versus let's say 62. What percentage will they be higher? Uh, will the higher benefit be inflation adjusted? Uh, you know, some simple things to see if they really understand the provisions. If they don't, and then I say, well, how are you valuing uh, waiting? You know, yes, you have to give up benefits for eight years between 62 and 70 if you're now 62, if you wait but you're going to get a much higher benefit. It's going to be over 70% higher. Right. Inflation. How do you, uh, how do you trade, you know, how do you compare the value of a much higher stream that, that's starting later with the value of a stream that's starting right now that's lower forever? How do you do that? Are you um, actual, you know, are you doing actual valuation? They say, yes. Well, I'd say that's not appropriate. Okay. Uh, we don't do that when it comes to every other insurance policy we buy, like homeowner's insurance or health insurance. We don't play the odds, which is what uh, actual evaluation is about. Uh, if they say they're uh, discounting at the stock market return, I'd say, are you adjusting for, you're not adjusting for risk. That's inappropriate. I think pretty quickly they'd understand they don't have uh, the background for for doing this correctly because this is like, you know, me pretending I could build a bridge over the Charles river in Boston. Uh, it's, it's just not, I don't have that, that training and knowledge. Right. So, uh, and most, you know, people may think that they have it, but when you really probe them, they'll realize that they don't. And, you know, for $40, that's what the software costs. Why not get the right answer? Right. Uh, you know, you you want to go to a doctor and prescribe, you know, or avoid going to a doctor and prescribe your own medicine, even if you could, right? Uh, even if you could walk into a pharmacy and get me, say, give me this, this, and this, you wouldn't do it. If you were smart, you would say, let me go talk to an expert. Same thing here. Right. That, that makes sense. So when people say, oh, well, I've, I've done the math and it's about a 14 year break even between me taking it at 62 and waiting until 70, and I don't think I'm going to live that long. Well, what do you say to that? I mean, I would, I would say think about break even in the context of the homeowner's insurance. Most people never break even on their homeowner's policy, right? They always pay the premiums. Always, for almost everybody, they exceed uh, what you get back from the policy. Right. Nobody does break even analysis because they know if their home does burn down, they're going to lose a good chunk chunk of their their lifestyle. They're going to be in terrible shape because. Uh, 
they've got a huge amount of money tied up in that house and they're otherwise going to have to, you know, build from scratch or rent from scratch with no, no you know, it's going to be devastating. So nobody right. does, does break even when it comes to car insurance, auto insurance, I mean, auto insurance, uh, health insurance, life insurance, uh, uh, homeowners insurance, nowhere except in the context of longevity insurance do people make this really uh, terrible mistake and think that this is a break-even analysis. And that's what the other software programs out there focus your attention on is a break-even. And that right there tells you that there are screwed up programs, to be quite honest, uh, because that's not the right thing to do. You want to look at the catastrophic loss when it comes to insurance. Your house burns down, you total your car, you have an extremely expensive operation, uh, you die and you've got uh, three kids or wait, you know, and a yes. wife who's depending on you or a spouse or husband. Uh, those are the catastrophic events that you look at when you're buying insurance. You don't play the odds. You look at the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario in this context is you live to 100 and you have to keep paying for yourself the whole way and then you run out of money. So that's why being patient to get a much higher number yeah. will continue, uh, when you are 100 is a much smarter deal for most households. Not for everybody, but maybe 75%. Wow. Yeah, that's important. You mentioned the, the term longevity insurance. I don't think a lot of our viewers know what that is. What, 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 would you, what are you classifying as longevity insurance? It's insurance against living on and on and on, you know, continuing to live. And that sounds like a good thing because you're not dying. But financially, it's a terrible thing because you have to keep paying for yourself every day. Right. Uh, and uh, it's the worst case scenario, financially speaking. And you have to insure yourself financially against that. So you want to have money that can, it's, uh, uh, you, you want to have a, a big payoff. You want to have a policy that really pays off the, uh, the longer you live. And it pays off more the longer you live. And that's what Social Security, uh, taking it later in life, uh, taking it, like, let's say, at age 70, really involves because you're getting this higher benefit. And the longer you live, the bigger the payoff from waiting. So it's exactly covering that risk. So that's why it's longevity insurance. That's what Social Security is selling, in effect, uh, even though they don't re really realize it. When they tell you you can take the benefit early at a low level or a higher number at a high, uh, later, they're letting you buy a higher number by giving up benefits for like eight years. They're selling a policy right there. And uh, that's... Um, so they're in the uh, longevity insurance business. I don't think uh, Social Security uh, uh, understands that because it's dominated by uh, actuaries and uh, it doesn't have that many economists there to really explain to the thousands of tens of thousands of staff around the country what the program is really about. Uh, Larry, you mentioned longevity insurance with, with people not receiving pensions um, or that not being as common practice for U.S. companies as it once was, people assess their needs in retirement. What are other things they can do to help ensure their longevity so that they don't have a lower standard of living at a time when they need it most if they do live to 100? Well, there, there, there's at least one company um, out there, there may be more, that sells inflation index annuities, which are, uh, you know, you put down some money and you get a, a, benefit, a, a payout that uh, continues um, as long as you live. Uh, that's what's called a single life annuity, or you can also buy a joint survivor annuity, which is uh, a, payout, <clears throat> a payout that will continue until um, uh, your spouse, uh, the last of you and your spouse passes away. So it's a last to die um, payout. And uh, you wanna get one that would be inflation indexed. So this is something you can do. You can buy a fully inflation indexed annuity from a private insurance company. If it's a reputable company, that's uh, something to consider. You can also buy um, inflation index bonds. They don't yield very much, but at least you're, you'll get some positive inflation adjusted uh, payout. Uh, they're called uh, TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. 
Uh, in terms of investment, um, you know, I would say uh, one thing to think about is uh, uh, securing your living standard or floor to your living standard by investing uh, uh, a chunk of your assets in these inflation index bonds or an inflation in index annuity, plus you have social security. So you can figure out, you know, how to get a floor to your living standard. And then any money you want to put in the stock market, just view that as casino money and uh, put it in there for a while. And uh, at some point, uh, transform what's ever left, whatever you've uh, um, obtained uh, from investing in the market and put it into inflation and index bonds and then spend out of those, uh, out of that income. So this way your living standard will never fall. You'll have a floor to your living standard and you'll just have upside to your living standard in the future if the stocks actually pan out. You won't be depending on them. So it's really like playing the casino. When we go to the casino, we leave our wallet at home, most of us. Yeah. We cash to the casino, right? Right. And we only spend our winnings if we leave the casino with some winnings. Right. I'm we can do the same thing here. Uh, and I call this upside investing in our software, Maxify.com. Uh, we don't have that in our program right now, but we're adding it over the next two months. We have that program. It's in our download tool, but uh, we're uh, upgrading it to our, uh, putting it into our Maxify tool so people can run that in a couple months and see how to get a floor to their living standard and just have upside risk to their uh, living standard through time. So Larry, that's interesting. You kind of share a philosophy with other economists that I've interviewed where it's cover your basic needs and expenses with guaranteed lifetime income sources and then optimize for inflation beyond that with what you refer to as maybe casino money or other potential investments that aren't so built for hedging longevity. It's a little bit different from getting an income floor just per se. Okay. It's a living standard floor. So it means you don't spend out of any money that's in the stock market. Right. Quite different. Okay. Then, uh, let's say bucketing your income, that's a term that people use in, in your industry. Uh, you can have, let's suppose you're having half your money in the stock market and half your money in social security benefits, okay? Okay. And you um, uh, say to yourself, well, I'm gonna earn 5% real on the stock stocks, so therefore I can spend more than my social security benefits every year. That's not securing your living standard. Right. Really, you have to spend at the, you know, level, you know, you basically want to spend just uh, your social security benefits every year. And then at some point, after you've transformed your stocks into something safe, like inflation index bonds, then you can spend out of that income. But that's how you have a secure future. Right. So not just a um, flooring of an income rule, it's a spending rule. So, uh, how well we do in the future depends on, you know, how we invest and uh, flooring our income is like investing, uh, but also how we spend. If we, if we spend or invest too aggressively, both things can endanger our future. Right. So, yeah. So, to clarify my question, what I was saying was find what you're going to need to have for your spending, not just your, not just your, your um, income goal, but what you're actually spending, cover that with social security-like income, guaranteed lifetime income, annuity income, and then the rest would be a supplement, not to draw down from that supplement to secure the standard of living. That's what I was saying. Yeah, but I think it's, um, it's a little more complicated than that. You can't kind of say, well, I want to spend uh, 80000 a year, and I'll go and figure out, I'll buy uh, annuities to cover that because uh, – the 80,000 may be more than you can spend than you can afford. Okay. So our software figures this all out, everything internally. It says, okay, uh, you tell us what safe rate of return you can earn and we'll figure out what floor you can have given how much you've got in the market and the stock market. So we'll say, okay, uh, tell us what you got in the stock market and what you're going to add to it. We're going to view that as entirely lost. And then we're going to figure out what you actually can spend every year, given that the rest of the money you have is being invested perfectly safely in, in inflation index bonds or in an annuity that's uh, because we take into account any safe streams in this calculation. 
We also take, uh, figure out your taxes. So all this stuff sounds like you might be able to do it on your own, but it's extremely complicated to get the yeah. taxes right. The spending depend on the taxes, the taxes depend on the spending. So you can't really do this at home. You have to- It's not a do it yourself job. It's not like you can just cover your needs. The, the planning software, what you're saying is it'll actually kind of, in a way, determine what you should be spending and then take out an account for an assessment of risk based on what you have. Is that, is that an accurate assessment? Well, it says anything you have on the market, you're going to add, forget about it, let it ride. It's in the casino and then run our program. Um, well, our program is going to ask you about that money, but run our program and we'll figure out the floor that you can uh, spend at from now till the end of time, till the end of your, till your maximum age of life. And then we will show you the upside if the money in the market actually pays off at the time you start withdrawing. Yeah. Converting to safe assets. So uh, you don't have to, you know, the thing does it all for itself, you know, all for you entirely. So you don't have to worry about um, uh, figuring any, any of this stuff out, including federal and state taxes, Medicare Part B premiums, all this stuff is interconnected. Uh, and that's why you have to do this uh, with really smart software. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And the Maxify software is so comprehensive to, you know, it figures all that out for you where yeah. somebody at home is not going to most likely not going to be able to account for everything. Right. Yeah. Right. So Larry, you talked about a specific type of single premium immediate annuity with an inflation adjusted rider. Um, you know, because annuities pay out at different ages, a higher amount based on your age, could somebody theoretically ladder deferred income annuities that would kick in at later stages in life with a higher payout? to hedge against uh, future in inflation costs? Well, you can buy deferred annuities that um, maybe start in 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, but the initial payout is not inflation indexed. It's not adjusted for the inflation between now and 15 years from now. It may be in fully adjusted thereafter, depending on the policy you buy. So I'm concerned about the 15 years between now and then. Right. You know, you say, okay, I'm gonna buy, um, something's gonna pay out $30,000 a year, uh, starting in 15 years. Right. Um, what if um, inflation takes off and the price of a hot dog becomes $2,000? Right. So $30,000 is going to pay to buy 15 hot dogs, right? Right. So, uh, so you really want to, you know, so these policies aren't necessarily safe against inflation between now and the point in which the, um, the annuity begins if you're still alive. So that's my concern with those policies. Otherwise, I like them a lot, you know, but yeah. Um, yeah, and if you have some other hedge against inflation, like you have a mortgage that um, where if inflation took off, your mortgage would, um, uh, the real, real pay, pay uh, you know, the real payments on your mortgage would be lower because uh, they'd be watered down by inflation. That can be a hedge. But our software can handle all this stuff. I mean, it can, it can right. Um, yeah, the bottom line is you got to run it through the software to find out if you're properly preparing for things like inflation or future tax increases. And set up an alternative profile where you consider 20% inflation every year and see how you're doing with this deferred annuity. Right. Uh, you know. That makes sense. So yesterday you mentioned that taxes mathematically will have to go up at some point. Should people be considering reclassifying fully taxable assets to Roth IRAs or life insurance now to protect themselves from the future tax increases. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's worth thinking about. Again, um, our maxify.com tool can uh, help you look at that because you can run a Roth conversion uh, under the current tax system, but you can also specify tax increases starting in the future. So, uh, uh, so you can see exactly that, um, you know, uh, the answer to that question, what, you know, does the advantage of a Roth IRA might not be much of an advantage of converting right now under current tax law, but if you're really worried about taxes going up a bunch and you think the Roth um, vehicle will then shelter those tax against those tax increases in the future, yeah. you can see it, okay, it doesn't, under this scenario, current law, there's not that big an advantage to doing a Roth conversion, but if taxes go up 20%, boy, it really pays off. <clears throat> so therefore I'm going to do it. 
Right. That makes sense. Larry, there's so much misinformation out there. There's a lot of great successful marketers and a lot of great salespeople out there who are providing financial education, either through the radio or print media or, you know, any, in any kind of medium. Where do people need to be careful? Where's good objective places that aren't partisan, that aren't trying to sell something where they can go get valuable information to make good financial decisions and rely on for financial education? Well, I think that um, if people are using us, you know, our software, you know, financial planners are using it with their clients, then the client knows that this is an independent analysis, that the program wasn't designed to help the financial planner sell product, right? Right. Because we, we sell the, you know, the software uh, to households directly to financial planners all around the country. So, and they also know that we don't sell any products that um, has its own software and is also selling products. You have to worry whether the software is designed to help them sell products. Uh, I and see I, what you're saying. I think that's the case for, I won't mention, I won't necessarily, uh, 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 all these companies, big companies, any of these companies that develop their own software, they have a conflict of interest, right? Right. A product, so they can't be giving you independent, impartial advice if they're also selling product because they're, they're going to be designing their software to sell the product. And right. So you have to look at the underlying software if it's coming from an independent, you know, um, academic source like an economist versus somebody who is you know geared towards earning your business and retaining assets like a big custodian what about on the radio and, and you know you hear all these things all the time like um you know i feel like the country gets programmed in these little 15 second sound bites where do people need to be careful when they get their education you know or they get their information from these sources how do people verify that and know what what is right for them and what isn't well um I think anything coming over the radio, any, anybody's trying to hawk something, be very, when it comes to financial matters, just walk away, Don't, turn off the radio, because uh, almost for sure that's um, some kind of snake oil they're selling you. Uh, if, you're, if you really want to uh, uh, get the right answer, I think you need to have a, either find the right software on your own, and I, again, I, I would recommend our software, Right. I'm the only economist I know that actually is, has produced financial planning software. We've done so starting you know, for 26 years now, and we're ranked or, you know, routinely at, uh, as the top software tool in the country. Right. Um, New York Times and different, uh, any, anybody really carefully reviews. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't think there's like 30 different options out there. Uh, I think that financial planners who use our software are reliable. If they're not using our software, I worry about the software they are using, whether it's designed to help them sell product. Even if they're not interested so much in pushing product on people, they may have software that, you know, just conveniently is helping them sell product, right? So, so frankly, you know, I wish I could say, well, there's these 10 programs that I would say um, are reliable alternatives to what we have i can't say that right yeah that makes sense you got to use the maxify software so um larry two more questions then we're going to wrap up you you had said um that we could be in our last interview on the precipice of a retirement crisis can you describe what that is and, and what people can do now to be proactive to help and see if they're on the path towards retirement crisis well we know lots of uh, baby boomers have shown up without enough uh, retirement savings in 401ks or regular assets. Uh, and uh, the social security benefits are not enough to help to get them through. So I, I, you know, uh, I talk to people all the time about their situation and lots of people are quite desperate. And what I tell people, even pe retired people, is find a job or stick or keep your job if you're currently working. So that's the best thing to do is keep working. Uh, as long as possible, uh, because the um, investing is very risky. You know, we we can invest in, right now. We're at a very low re real return in inflation index bonds or in inflation indexed uh, annuities. Will give you a higher real return, but you know, it comes at a, a cost that if you die, 
um, there's no money for your kids because you've invested it uh, this way. On the other hand, that may be the best way to keep your kids safe from having to kick in to help you. Uh, so annuities cut both ways on that score. Uh, so, uh, but even there, uh, you know, it's not gonna be a fantastic return. It's gonna be a moderate return. And so uh, people are unprepared for long retirement and retirement could be much longer than most people expect. So we have to keep working or we have to go back to work if we've retired. That's my uh, you know, advice that uh, people consider doing that. And uh, I know a lot of people uh, who are retired early are worried that, might worry that if they work, uh, they'll lose their social security benefits, which is true, but then they'll get what they lose back in, the, in general, not in every case, but probably 90% of the cases in the form of higher uh, uh, ben retirement benefits once they reach full retirement age because there's something called the adjustment of the reduction factor <clears throat> that says if you lose money to the earnings test under Social Security because you work and earn money and you lose some of your benefits, you will be able to get a higher benefit. Uh, it'll automatically go up. Your benefit will automatically go up after uh, you hit full retirement age in light of how much you lost. So do not worry. Um, and again, you can see this in our software if you run it with, um, uh, what if I go back and work? You'll see that the, uh, the loss of lifetime social security benefits is now, is, can be zero. Uh, even if you are losing your current benefits, you'll get a higher benefit later. Wow, that makes sense. Um, Larry, as, as we're finishing up here, you had told me kind of a unique story on the phone about how you had personally used um, life insurance, talking about continuing to work, how you had personally used life insurance and an annuity um, can you elaborate on that a little bit so we can get some insight? I thought it was an interesting story. Well, uh, so on life insurance, um, I'm still working. Uh, I don't intend to retire. Uh, I can do that much more easily than most people because I'm a tenured professor of economics. So, you know, it's, I, you know, it's easy for me to say, go keep working, or go back to work. I know how hard it is and how much age discrimination there is. I see it um, all the time. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not uh, being cavalier and telling people to keep working. It's not, you know, that's a two-part decision, your decision, but also your employer's decision that could fire you, right? Right. Yeah. But, um, of course, there's also an Age Discrimination Act, so you could, you know, if they just fire, uh, fire you purely because you're old, you can uh, you know, uh, put in a, a lawsuit against them. They do that. Now, um, so since I'm still working and I have to, uh, I still have uh, a, a college age student and um, a, a former wife who I, have to, who I uh, still making alimony payments to and uh, current, my current wife, I, you know, all of whom are depending on my continued earning, uh, I realized from using our software that I need life insurance and I bought life insurance even at you know, my tender age. And, um, uh, you know, it's expensive, but I got a policy that um, is affordable and uh, everybody's now secure. And I'm much happier and can sleep at night because of that. So life insurance can be important at really at all ages. Um, annuities, as for annuities, I'll just give you the story of my mom. When she was 89, she passed away about a year ago at 98. When she was 89, yeah, thank you. Um, well, she had a, a, good, a good run. Um, so at 89, uh, we had a certain amount of uh, money that um, uh, set aside for her. And I went to my brother and sister and I said, uh, let's um, take this money and buy an annuity for her, inflation indexed annuity. And uh, they said, uh, and they're extremely well educated, um, uh, I won't get into the details, but um, uh, they just were not that familiar with annuities. <clears throat> and they said, well, mom's 89. Her life expectancy is like two years, three years. She has these con this condition, that condition, this condition. Um, we think it's, you know, throwing money, good money out the drain, down the drain. I said, no, I think we should buy this because the real risk is she'll live to 100. And uh, 
Uh, so I insisted, we bought the annuity, and it really mattered a lot in terms of our being able to you know, sustain her right through age 98. Uh, we had obviously, we had to kick in more money as she got older, but um, it met, you know, was the right thing to do. We, she would have, uh, the money we um, had would have uh, run out within a couple of years, probably by the time she was uh, certainly 92, 93, it would have been gone. So this really was an extremely smart thing to do, which I've done. I got to, you know, lord it over my brother and sister. <laughs> And still, still do. Um, you know, it just uh, we have you have to look at the lo- the downside of longevity risk very carefully because so many people tell me about their parents uh, living to ninety three, ninety eight, whatever. Uh, it and we have uh, people over a hundred is the fastest growing age group in the U.S. right now. By the middle of the century, we're going to have about 3 million people over 100. Wow. And this is without any additional scientific breakthroughs like cures for cancer. So, so I hope everybody does take this issue really uh, seriously and uh, I hope everybody makes the right uh, social security decisions going forward. Well, Larry, it's been an honor to have you here today. Thank you so much for that insight and the personal sharing. I mean, I know you're extremely busy. Um, you know, in our evaluation and our use of uh, you know, maximize my social security benefits and the Maxify planner, those really are some of the most comprehensive tools to help people assess risks like you described with your mom ahead of time so that they don't have to have a lower standard of living and they do account for longevity risk to make sure they have some security in retirement. So I think that's invaluable. Do you have any new projects or books coming out that you'd like to let everybody know about now? Well, I'm, I'm posting a lot of case studies on uh, Maxify.com. So if, the, if you go to the bottom of Maxify.com, there's It'll say case studies. You can click on that. You'll see uh, case studies coming along through time that are showing you uh, ways to have a higher living standard in retirement, but uh, safely and also to think of how to think about investing. And they're based on the software, but even if you don't buy the software or use it with a financial planner, you'll get some insight. And then I'll probably take these case studies and wrap them into a book called Money Magic. That's what I'm working on right now. That's so, exciting. I might come out in a year or so. All right. Well, you got your first uh, purchaser of Money Magic right here. I'm very excited for that book. Larry, your time is so invaluable. Thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate having you on. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your summer, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. You take care. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Larry.